I'm going to invite Jeremy to come. He's going to read Romans chapter 12, verses 3 to 21 to us. If you are able, would you stand, please, as Jeremy reads to us from Romans chapter 12, verses 3 to 21. Because of the privilege and authority God has given me, I will give each of you this warning. Don't think you're better than you really are. Be honest in your evaluations of yourselves, measuring yourselves by the faith God has given us. Just as our bodies... just as our bodies have many parts and each part has a special function, so it is with Christ's body. We are many parts of one body and we all belong to each other. In his grace, God has given us different gifts for doing certain things well. So if God has given you the ability to prophecy, speak out with as much faith faith as God has given you. If your gift is serving others, serve them well. If you are a teacher, teach well. If your gift is to encourage others, be encouraging. If it is giving, give generously. If God has given you leadership ability, take the responsibility seriously. And if you have a gift for showing kindness to others, do it gladly. Don't just pretend to love others. Really love them. Hate what is wrong. Hold tightly to what is good. Love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honoring each other. Never be lazy, but work hard and serve the Lord enthusiastically. Rejoice in our confident hope. Be patient in trouble and keep on praying. When God's people are in need, be ready to help them. Always be eager to practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Don't curse them. Pray that God will bless them. Be happy that those who are happy. Be happy with those who are happy and weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with each other. Don't be too proud to enjoy the company of ordinary people. And don't think you know it all. Pay back all evil. I mean, never pay back evil with more evil. Do things in such a way that everyone can see you are honorable. Do all that you can to live in peace with everyone. Dear friends, never take revenge. Leave that to the righteous anger of God. For the scriptures say, I will take revenge. I will pay them back, says the Lord. Instead, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals of shame on their heads. Don't let evil conquer you, but conquer evil by doing good. As we begin, I want to be, uh, ask you a very deep spiritual question. How important is a nail? That really isn't a deep spiritual question, but I got your attention. How important is a nail? And if you really think deeply about that, you say, well, it depends on what the nail's used for, where it's at, all that kind of stuff. But we would think of a single individual nail as not really being all that significant. There's an old saying that goes way back a couple hundred years. Somebody very, very famous said it. That was Benjamin Franklin. He said, for the want of a nail, the shoe was lost. Talking about a horseshoe, came off of a horse's foot because it didn't have a nail. For want of a nail, the shoe was lost. For want of a shoe, the horse was lost. For want of a horse, the rider was lost. And for want of a rider, the battle was lost. For want of the battle, the kingdom was lost. All for the want of a horseshoe nail. There was a kingdom was lost because of one little nail. The point of that little ditty, that little idea, is that the things that seem so small and insignificant and we wouldn't give much attention to, depending on where they are and what they're used for and their place within the scheme of things, can have tremendous significance that goes far beyond we could ever imagine. And the same thing is true within the body of Christ, within God's people, within God's family. Today, I'm finishing up this sermon series that we've been involved in. This is the fourth message called Building the Body. Building the Body. We we mentioned that Paul often used the picture of a body to illustrate what the church is like. In fact, between Paul primarily and then also a little bit with some of the other New Testament writers, the idea of the church being compared to a body is over 30 times mentioned in the New Testament. And it makes such a great picture because we are, when I say we, not just our church, but the church of Jesus Christ is his body in the world. It's his physical presence. Jesus even said so. You know, once he left, his presence is manifested through his people. That's true on a grand scale of God's people, the church all throughout history. It's uh, true in a grand scale today of all of God's people that are alive today, wherever they are in the world, they are his body. But it's also true in a smaller scale right here in this church. 
if you're a part of this church body, we call it a church body, this church family, then we are a body of Christ also. And we've been talking about four different principles in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 that describe the church's function, the relationships, the activity, how God wants to use us together to accomplish his purposes in the world. The first thing we talked about was unity. Unity. If we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and I just want to read to you right now from 12 to 14. It says, For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but many. In those three verses, did you see how many times the word one was used? I didn't count them, but there's a lot of them in there. Because the focus is that even though we are all different people, together we make up one body. Just like your physical body has a lot of different parts and pieces, all connected, hopefully. Fingers and toes and all the stuff you can see and all the stuff you can't see and the stuff that's on the inside. It's all, uh, they're all different. They all serve different functions, but it's still one body. So we spent a whole message talking about how important that unity is within our church body. That we are in good and close relationship with one another and that we work together well with one another. And when there are difficulties and problems, we diligently seek to work those out because we need to walk in unity to fully accomplish God's plans and purposes in our midst, but also in our world. And the challenge that day was to strengthen your connections in the sense of strengthen the relationships that you have within the body of Christ because that really is what it comes down to. Our relationships together enable us to work together to accomplish what God calls us to do. The second week we talked about diversity. Same verses. The emphasis was on the oneness but the secondary emphasis was that even though the body is just one it's made up of many members. Okay, A lot of different parts, a lot of different pieces. And again, you could go through those three verses and count the word many or something similar to that that, that that illustrates or tries to describe the fact that there's a lot of different things that are involved. And we said that even though we are one, we need to keep in mind that God created each of us uniquely. God loves each of us uniquely. God wants a relationship with each of us uniquely. We're not just part of a big group. And as we look through chapter 12 of 1 Corinthians, it talks about spiritual gifts. The passage that Jeremy read a little while ago in um, Romans 12 talks about spiritual gifts. Another passage we're going to look at the end of the sermon today in 1 Peter 4 talks about spiritual gifts. And all that means is that God puts within us as individuals different abilities and talents and gifts that enable us to do things well. And the idea is that we all do different things, although there are some similarities between certain gifts and, and, and that kind of thing. And sometimes we need two of this and three of that, just like you got, you know, five fingers, if you count the thumb, uh, ten fingers on each, five fingers on each hand. Okay. Anyway, the point is we need a lot of different things going on. So God gives different gifts, talents, and abilities to the individuals within the church, and we need to celebrate our diversity. Celebrate that there are a lot of differences between us, but we are one. But each of those unique differences are important because we don't need a hundred fingers and that's all we have. We need the whole body. Then last week, we talked about the idea of inferiority. Inferiority. Not that that's a good thing. That's a bad thing. But when we allow the enemy to come in or other people, unfortunately, sometimes make us feel inferior. We see that in verses 15 to 20. It says here, if the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. So we have here in this part, the inferiority, parts of the body saying, well, I am this, but I really would rather not be this. 
you know, since I'm not this, I don't belong. I'm not important. I'm inferior. And Paul says, no, that's not true. That's not true. It leads to feelings of insignificance and discontentment and jealousy and envy. And so our challenge for last week was wherever God has put you within the body of Christ, be content and be faithful. Be content where he's placed you and be faithful to do what he's called you to do. And he may leave you in that position for a while. He may move you on. He may change what you're going to do. But just trust him, be content, and be faithful. And that leads us to the last thing that we're going to talk about, and that's superiority. Just the opposite of the inferiority. There are those who may feel like, oh, I'm not that important. I'm not that significant because I'm not this and I'm not that. You've got the other side, which is a lot more dangerous. And that's the people who think, well, I'm somebody. I'm the one that's really important. They can't do without me. I can do without them, but they can't do without me. And so we're going to spend our time today talking about this idea of superiority. And our challenge by the time we get to the end is that we serve in humility. Because I'll be honest with you, and hopefully you'll be honest with yourself, we all can be tempted with this. We all can battle with pride. If you don't believe that now, hopefully through the course of what I'm going to share with you, you'll begin to realize, well, you know, maybe I do. Maybe I do struggle with pride. In fact, you may be really proud that you don't struggle with pride. As we continue on in our passage here in 1 Corinthians 12, and we look at verse 21, Paul goes on after dealing with the inferiority side. He says, the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. This idea of I am important, the position I hold, the gift I have, what I do for God and his people is so important. And what you do is not important. In fact, it's not even necessary and it's not even worth considering. It's not that important and um, we could actually do without you. It's kind of the idea that it's here. And, and Paul is talking to a church that really wrestled with this. I'm so glad that I don't see signs of us wrestling with this a whole lot other than the fact that we all wrestle with pride and that's what I'm asking God to deal with all of our hearts about today including myself, the pride that we sometimes give in to. But the Corinthian church had a lot of divisions and a lot of problems and a lot of pride and the rich were oppressing the poor and denying the poor and looking down on the poor and there was this aspect also where they took great uh, pride in the spiritual gifts they had. Now, we've not spent a lot of time talking about individual spiritual gifts or what they are, and we're not going to today either, other than to say the fact that God has given all different kinds of gifts and abilities because the church needs all different kinds of gifts and abilities. But some of them are more obvious than others. Some are more glamorous than others. Some are more public than others. Some receive more attention than others. And those were the ones that the church at Corinth were all excited about. And those are the ones that actually Paul's talking to right now. There are people, if you read all of 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14, and Paul gives all these instructions about the spiritual gifts, it seems to indicate that there were three supernatural gifts that people were so excited about. The ability to prophesy, in other words, to speak for God in front of everybody. The ability to give a message in tongues, a language they never learned. That's something that they did. And then the ability to interpret that because those are very obvious, very supernatural, very vocal. Um, you know, everybody saw it. And this is somebody speaking for God. And so they had this idea, these are the best gifts. And people that were manifested and used in those type of gifts were battling a lot of pride. And so... Some people were discouraged because they didn't have one of these gifts. That's what led to the inferiority. Well, God doesn't use me to prophesy. God doesn't use me to give a message in tongues. God doesn't use me to interpret. I just clean the bathrooms. You know, I just work behind the scenes. I just teach a little class with three or four students in it, you know. I'm not as important. See, that led to the inferiority side. But these other ones thought they were, very, they were something very, very special because they had these special gifts. And Paul says, that's not the way it is. He says, they're all important. With our time together today, I want to talk a little bit about the points that Paul is trying to make. I call it Paul's points. But then after that, I want to talk about how we can avoid the trap of pride. 
because we do all battle with that. So what are the points that Paul is trying to make? Just three real quick. Three of Paul's points. The first one is this, that pride is not proper. Pride is not proper. And, and I just read verse 21 when he talks about the eye looking at the hand saying, I don't need you. The head looking at the feet saying, I don't need you. His communication, his idea is that it is not proper to be caught up in pride. This feeling of superiority, this feeling that I'm more important, what I do is more important, and so I don't need you. Now, I'm going to ask you to do something. Don't be real obvious now, okay? Look around you. Who's sitting around you that's not near as important as you are? Don't point. Who's sitting around you that's not near as important than you, as you are to the church? Who has responsibilities and ministries and things that aren't as important as yours are? Now, now look around again. At, now, who, who has responsibilities and ministries that are a lot more important than yours? You're like, Pastor, let's get beyond this. Could we? One more question. Look around you. Again, don't point. Who sitting around you do you think we could really do without in our church? Now, you're all laughing. You're all like, this, did that make you feel uncomfortable? It made me uncomfortable to tell you to do it. But I did it on purpose because even though we'd say, no, no, I don't think that way. And maybe you don't in a normal situation and you don't want to. But as soon as I asked you those questions, names started popping in your head, didn't they? People were kind of like, it's like, no, 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 I can't think that way. No, that's not the way I'm supposed to. And that's the whole point I'm trying to say. Even though we don't want pride to be part of our life, even though we might say, hey, I want to live according to God's word. I understand that all of God's people are important, and I know that I'm not important more than somebody else. Inside, we really feel like we are. In our flesh. And we have this thing going on in our head where we rate ourselves and we rank ourselves and, and, and we may not put ourselves way at the very top, most number one position because that's mine, by the way. I don't really believe that. But anyway. But we rank ourselves, don't we? Without really wanting to sometimes, without really trying to. It's like, well, this is important. That's not as important. You know, and we, so I, again, I, the reason I took the time to do this is I really wanted to emphasize this. We do, we do, we battle this. But again, I want to repeat what I said earlier. I am so thankful before God that as the pastor of this church, I don't see this being a big problem in our church at all. But the reason I want us to keep to, to focus on this today is number one, this is what we're dealing with. But also, I think one of the reasons in areas where we have strength is because we've had good teaching and we decide to apply it. And so that's what I'm hoping will happen today that we get some more good teaching about this area of pride that we don't struggle too much with, but that God will help us to struggle even less with. And maybe we can get better at what Paul wants us to do. Okay? So pride is not proper. Seeing others as insignificant, not important, not necessary, at least not as much as I am, that's not proper. I think we know that. So we need to deal with it, but we all struggle with it. The second thing he emphasizes, his point, second point here is that every person is important. Every person is important. Now, he's already said that earlier in the passage. We've talked about that for the last three weeks. But he, he approaches it in a little bit different way as we continue on in our passage, verses 22 to 24. He says, on the contrary. On the contrary to what? The eyes saying um, to the hand, I don't need you, or the head to the feet, I don't need you. He says, on the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor, and our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which our more presentable parts don't require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it. What Paul is saying is outward appearances can be deceiving. What you see and what you perceive doesn't necessarily communicate true value. As he's talking to this church and their battle, I don't know how public their battle was. I mean, they had a lot of public battles. There were a lot of things going on in their church. But he said, you know, as you begin to evaluate yourself compared to other people, you may think you're so important because you look important. But that outward appearance can be deceiving. What you see doesn't communicate the real value. When I jokingly said, I'm the most important here at the church because I'm the pastor. There might be some of you thought that say, well, there is some truth to that. That's just because it appears that way. Maybe. Possibly. Because I stand up here and talk to you every week. 
but it doesn't make it so. Appearances can be deceiving. He says there are weaker parts of our body that are indispensable. Along these lines, I think of, not just because they're weaker in the sense that they're not strong, but because you don't see them, because you don't use them to lift or to, 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 um, to move or whatever. But I think of our internal organs. We don't think too much about them. Let me ask you, how many of you thought about your liver this morning? Some of you may have thought about your kidneys because you may be diabetic or pre-diabetic or something. You know, how many of you thought about your spleen this morning? I asked you that question a couple weeks ago. Did anybody, you know, I asked a couple weeks ago, nobody had. So did you learn from that? Did anybody think about their spleen this morning? I did because I reviewed my notes. But you know what? Try to do without your liver. Try to do without your kidneys. Try to do without your spleen. It's going to be in a world of hurt, literally and figuratively. Those parts that just don't seem that important, they're indispensable. Now, I don't know. I wouldn't want to do without one of my fingers. I wouldn't want to do without my hand. I wouldn't want to do without my arm. I wouldn't want to do without a foot or a leg. But you know what? You can still live. And you can still do, and you can still, without those things, they seem so important because they are, but you can do without them if you have to. But we often think they're more important than the other parts we don't think about, and Paul says that's not the point. The point is they're all important. And he talks about those that are less honorable and those that are unpresentable, we give special treatment to. You know, those parts of our bodies that we don't want other people to see, or at least we shouldn't want other people to see. That's another whole cultural problem. Because of modesty or other reasons, he says they're just as important. I want you to picture that you need to buy a new car. And you got a certain amount of money, enough, but not enough to get anything and everything you'd want. You go to the car dealership and you're looking at the cars and, and you, this, the, the car dealer is showing you all the things. They say, I got a really, really special deal for you. And he takes you to this vehicle. He's already found out what kind of vehicle you're looking for, what kind you like. He, he, he's, he's found out what you like as far as colors. And he takes you to this vehicle, and you see it and say, this is it. This is perfect. It's a beautiful vehicle. It's the, the model you want. It's the perfect color. It's just glowing and shining in all the lights. You know, it looks like a commercial. It's on a thing. It's turning it around. It's like, that's going to be it. And you say, oh, I'm afraid to ask, how much is this? And he names a price way less than you thought it would be. And you're like, are you serious? C can I get that in writing? I mean, you've got twice that much money in your, in your bank account, and you thought you were going to have to put it as a down payment and take out a loan. He says, no, this is a special deal just for you, just for today. And that's how much it is. And you say, wow, that sounds good. And then, so you take a closer look. And you open up the hood and there's nothing under it. <laughs> and you go to start and it won't start because there's not only nothing under the hood, there's nothing behind the dashboard. It just looks good. That's, that's a silly, silly illustration. But as beautiful as that car is, <laughs> it's worthless without the parts that aren't obvious, that don't seem that significant from sight. Another thing to illustrate, have you ever thrown away something that you didn't think you needed, but then you found out later you did? Yeah, I mean, that's happened to me many times. You know, you, you walk through the house or the garage or whatever, and you find something on the floor. It's like, I don't know what that is. And, you know, when you're younger and more immature, you just say, throw it in the trash. And then a week later, you realize it fell off the vacuum sweep, or it fell off this, or it fell off that. And it's like, oh. I need that, and you have to go buy another one or whatever. So I've learned if I'm walking through the house, garage, whatever, and I just find something and I have no clue what it's from, <laughs> I got a little jar and I stick it in there because <laughs> later on down the road when it says, oh, that's what that's from, then I've got it. But you know what? Sometimes we do that in the body of Christ. Sometimes we do that in our relationships. We're all important. You know, when we're part of a church, not just coming to church, but part of a church, it's more than just coming to hear the worship team and sing along when you can or to hear the preacher preach. 
We are all called together to work together to do God's work in this place and in our community and every ministry and every person involved in any way is significantly important and not just the ones you see, not just the ones you notice, not just the ones you hear, but all of those who work behind the scenes are just as important. And when we battle with pride, we need to keep that in mind. And then the third point Paul makes is we need each other. We need each other. Verses 25 to 27. He says that there may be no division in the body. Going back to the idea of unity, that we, we need to make sure there's no division. We need to take care of problems because we've got to all work together. But that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Now you are the body of Christ and individual members of it. He says we need each other. We've already talked quite a bit. We need to work together, but we need to care for one another. In other words, we're not just an organization like a job where we just do our part so we can accomplish something with no feelings involved. And hopefully that's not the way your job is either, but there are some jobs like that. You go in, you punch a clock, you do what you got to do, you leave. That's the extent of it. Hopefully you've got good relationships with people at your job, but especially within the church, within the body of Christ, our relationships are so key, not just so we can be effective, but so we can really care for one another and be there for each other and love one another and support one another and help one another and encourage one another. Minister to one another, meet one of those needs. That's the only way the body can be strong and healthy. He says that our relationships should be such that when one part hurts, we all hurt. And we're familiar with that. Every single one of us probably has stubbed our toe in the middle of the night walking through the living room because somebody rearranged the furniture and didn't let us know. <laughs> or maybe we rearranged the furniture and we forgot. Or we just misjudged, whatever. You know, you stub your toe. You, you hit your thumb with a hammer. It isn't just your thumb that hurts. It's your whole body that hurts, right? And maybe you've had the privilege of eating some kind of delicious Meal or dessert. This is the wrong time of day to be talking about this. And not only do your taste buds rejoice, but your whole body's like, mm hmm, you know? And Paul says that's the way we're supposed to be in the body of Christ. The passage that Jeremy read just a little while ago, Romans 12, 15, Paul says something similar. He says, rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep. It's true, you know, when someone has something really good happens that they're rejoicing, and chances are you may not feel the exact same joy they have because it happened to them, but yet there's something in us that we should respond in the same way when someone is hurting or when someone has lost someone, and we've seen that happen so many times, unfortunately, the last couple of weeks, lost a loved one. You're not going to feel the exact same pain they do. But if you're in right relationship, if we are in right relationship, we're going to feel some of that pain. And when it says we should rejoice with those that rejoice and mourn with those that mourn, we really do do that, don't we? And when you're on the side that you're the one that's received that, you're, you've got something really great happen or you've had something terrible happen, you want to share that with someone. In most cases, sometimes we want to keep it to ourselves, but because we want to know that somebody else cares. We want to know that somebody else is helping me, they're going to help me carry this. We want them to, to feel with us. And hopefully, thankfully, you've all experienced that, that we have each other. And Paul just says that's the way it should be, that's the way it needs to be. And because of that, we need to deal with this pride issue. So that's what I want to talk about now uh, for the rest of our time is how can I avoid the trap of pride? How can I avoid the trap of of pride that Paul's talking about here. Again, hopefully it's not a big deal for you. I don't perceive it as a pastor being a big deal in our church, but as we've already established, we all wrestle with it. So how can we avoid this? How is it that we can really be that type of person that we are part of the body of Christ, we're part of this family, and we are in relationship with one another, and we're being effective for the kingdom of God because of that relationship without the pride, without all this other junk getting in the way? How can I avoid the trap of pride. The passage that Jeremy read a little while ago, chapter 13 of Romans, verses 3 to 21, I'm not going to reread, but I'm going to pick a couple of things from that. That whole passage is a wonderfully practical uh, passage on how to live the Christian life. 
And I would encourage you to read it and study it maybe this week. It talks again about the church being the body of Christ. It's one of those other places, major places, where Paul uses that picture. You may remember that from when Jeremy read it. That the church is the body of Christ, and God has given spiritual gifts to the body. And in that passage, he exhorts me. He says, listen, whatever your spiritual gift is, do it to the best of your ability. You know, if you're, if, if you're one who gives, gives generously. If you're one who shows mercy, you know, and all these different gifts. You know, there's some gifts he lists in 1 Corinthians 12. Some he lists in Romans 12. Some he lists in Ephesians. Some of them have overlap. There's a whole lot more gifts, I think, that God has given than we have listed in Scripture because there's a lot of things he wants us to do. But he basically says, whatever you do, do it to the best of your ability. And in the context of that, he also talks about how we need to be in relationship with each other. And that relates to spiritual gifts because as we use our gifts, we have to work together. But it also has to do with the fact that we are part of a family, we are part of a body, so we need to be in good relationship with one another. So that's really what this passage is all about. So let me just give you three thoughts. There's a whole lot more things we can do, but three main things that we can do to avoid the trap of pride. Num uh, pride. Number one, think right thoughts. Think right thoughts. Now, we could do a whole, not only sermon, but sermon series on that. Our thoughts control who we are and who we become. Now, when I say think right thoughts, I'm not talking about don't think sinful thoughts. Don't do that either. I'm not talking about, well, be sure you think positive thoughts, which is a wonderful thing to do. Paul talks about that in Philippians 4. But I'm talking about thinking right thoughts about yourself. In fact, I didn't put it on the PowerPoint, but you might want to write that next to it if you're taking note. Think right thoughts about yourself. Think right thoughts about yourself. Let me just read a couple of verses here. In Romans 12, verses 3 to 5. Oh, I better turn there, don't I? <laughs> I'm sorry. I was still back in Corinthians. There we go. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you to not think of himself more highly than he ought to think. Now, ladies, it says himself, so I guess you're off the hook. No, of course not. It means all of us. I say to everyone among you not to think of himself or her, herself more highly than he or she ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we all have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members one of another. We need to think right thoughts we need to think as paul says with sober judgment in other words we need to be honest with ourselves we need to be honest with ourselves now again we don't want to take it too far till we put ourselves so far down now we fall into that camp that i talked about last week where we feel this inferior like i'm not near as important i'm not sick no that's not what paul's saying he's saying to battle the pride we need to think honestly and sincerely and soberly about ourselves Three things that go along with that. Not more highly of myself than I ought. Not more highly of myself than I ought. That's exactly what he says here. He says, don't think more of yourself than you are. Now, he's not saying put yourself down. Don't think you're nothing, nobody important, un unimportant, insignificant, inferior. But he's saying, listen, don't raise yourself up either. Don't think more highly of yourself than you ought to. Later in the chapter, in verse 16, he says, don't be haughty. But associate with the lowly. Now, he's not saying there are some people that are lowly and high and you've got to be nice to them. He's just saying we're in different positions in society. We're in different positions in the church. We have different responsibilities. Whatever you think is high, whatever you think is low, you know, you need to associate with all kinds of people. He says, do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Never be wise in your own sight. Think right thoughts, not more highly of myself than I ought. The second part is more highly of others than myself. Now, he doesn't talk about that here in Romans, but in Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, Paul talks about this. He says, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. He says, listen, we need to be unselfish. And we need to pay more attention to other people than we do to ourselves. We don't need to be so caught up in ourselves that we don't pay attention to other people. Or we're more important than somebody else. My needs are more important than their needs. 
And he gives us, if you continue to read that passage on, a great example, and that is Jesus Christ. He says this is the way Jesus is, the way Jesus was, the Jesus always ha- the way Jesus always has been, and the Je- way Jesus always will be. He, he was God, but he put many of the privileges and everything that had to do to the side. He never gave up his godhood, but he, but he set that to become a man for our good. And he's not even asking us to think that we're less important than somebody else or less significant. He says, count others more significant. He says, wherever you think you are in the spectrum, that's not as important as the fact that, listen, you're going to take your eyes off of yourself and you're going to put them on somebody else. And you're going to make sure that you're more concerned with them than you are yourself. So we think right thoughts not more highly of myself than I ought to think think and more highly of others than myself and then the third one is recognizing the value of others recognizing the value of others and the passage i put for that is first corinthians 12 22 to 24 we already read that that's the one where paul said that you know that those parts of the body that seem weaker are not indispensable those that are less honorable or unpresentable they're still important And as we recognize what we've already talked about this morning, that all the parts of the body, just like all the people within the body of Christ, are just as important, and we need to recognize the value of other people. Can I tell you that God is really good at leveling the playing field? The Bible says over and over and over, all throughout the Old Testament, all throughout the New Testament, not only does it say it, but it gives illustrations. It shows God doing it, but it says that God will lift up the humble but he's going to put down the proud. I think I'd much rather do that myself so God doesn't have to. So that's what we're talking about here. Think right thoughts. I challenge you to make it part of your prayer. I mean, don't be so introspective that you've lose focus of everything else, but God, where is my heart? Where is my mind in relation to this thing? Show me where I think that I'm more important than I am. Show me where I think I'm more important than other people. Show me where I'm placing others below me. Show me where I'm dismissing people. Show me where I'm being selfish. So think right thoughts. The second piece of advice on how to avoid the trap of pride is show appreciation. I tell you, this one's not complicated at all. Show appreciation. Back to Romans chapter 12, verse 10. It says, love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. I love the way the English Standard Version translates this. Outdo one another in showing honor. In other words, it's like you're in a competition. See who can show other people the most honor, the most appreciation, the most thanks. Outdo one another in showing honor. You know, we all like to be appreciated. I've never met a single person who, does, who likes to be taken for granted or to feel unappreciated, unappreciated. And one of the things we can actually do to help us with the pride issue, because it helps get our minds and our thoughts off of ourselves and what we're doing and what we are and who we are and how God uses us and, and how important we are, is that we put our focus on other people and what they're doing and we express that in a way of showing appreciation and we give thanks. And the good thing is this is something every single one of us can do. In fact, this is something that every single one of us can do 10 times before we leave today without it taking very much time. I'm not saying that's what you should do. But I'm just saying this is not complicated, but I believe that we should and could and need to do it more. Sincerely, not to stroke people's egos, not to make them feel better of you, but sincerely and honestly showing appreciation. And it's very simple. You look at somebody else, you get it figured out in your head, and then you say it. Thank you for, fill in the blank, I really appreciate that you fill in the blank. It's not that complicated. It's not rocket science. Again, it needs to be sincere. It needs to be honest. Don't thank them and tell them you appreciate for something they don't ever do. That's flattery. That's lying. But something that you really see, something you really appreciate... I want to take a minute to challenge those of you, and there's many of you in this room, that you are a leader at this church. And there are people who serve God under you. 
So include our elders, our deacons, our deaconesses, the head of our various ministries, where you are over a certain ministry, and there are other people who, who help out with that ministry, but you're the one in charge. And I want to challenge you. I want to challenge you to do this all the time. That you take the time to thank the people who work with you. You're in the leadership position, but they work with you, and they serve under you to accomplish that area of ministry that you're in charge of. That you take the time to thank them and let them know how much you appreciate them and be specific. Now, it's so easy to say, well, they already know. Well, they may know. Just like you probably already know what you're doing, but sure, but it sure does feel good when somebody notices and someone says something about it. You know, it doesn't happen every meeting. But I think I can honestly say in most of, most of my elder meetings and most of our deacon meetings, there's two different boards we have in our church. We have an elder board and a deacon board. In most of our meetings, when we get to the end, I say something to them along the lines of, listen, I really appreciate each and every one of you and your spouse and your family. I appreciate that you've taken the time for this meeting. I appreciate your leadership in this church. You are making a real difference in this church. And I do that deliberately, number one, because it's true. I'm not just trying to build up my elders and my deacons and my deaconesses. I'm not trying to stroke their egos. I'm not trying to get them on my good side so if I propose something, they'll agree with me. It's because it's true. I also try to apply that anytime I see anybody doing anything. If I'm walking from one building to the other and somebody's cutting the grass... And the mower's not too loud for them to hear me. I'll say, hey, listen, thank you so much for cutting the grass. Somebody's hanging a light fixture, you know. Hey, I really appreciate that you're doing that. I, I just, I just, I'm not putting glory. I'm, I'm just saying this is something I set out long time ago to try to make a part of who I am in my character. And I still fail at times. There's times I should thank people that I forget or I overlook because I got something else on my mind. But I'm just saying I'm trying to make that part of my, and the only reason I put it is I want to encourage you to do the same thing especially those of you that are in leadership. But even if you're not in leadership, in fact, just the opposite, if you serve in a ministry where somebody's over top of you in the sense of giving leadership to that, I want you to turn that around and do it the other way. When's the last time you told the person who's over you in leadership and said, hey, listen, I just want to let you know, I really appreciate you leading this ministry. It's such a privilege for me to be a part of it. Thank you that you trust me and you, and you use me and, and thank you for, the, for, for giving the leadership. I mean, you know, when was the last time that maybe you told one of our elders or our deacons or deaconesses, hey, listen, I know that's a, that's a very important and heavy responsibility in our church and I just really appreciate the time and energy and effort you put into it and the prayer you put into it, you know, and this is not a guilt thing. I'm just giving you examples. Just giving you examples. Or how about ministries that affect you or your family? When was the last time you told your Sunday school teacher, if you're in Sunday school, hey, listen, I really appreciate that you, you get up here and teach however often. Some teach every week, some are every other week, once a month, twice a month, whatever. I really appreciate that you spend time during the week so you're prepared to stand up here to teach, and I get to sit and learn because of you doing that. And I just thank you, and I appreciate that. When was the last time, if you have children, that you talk to the people that minister to your children, whether they're in the nursery or in kids' church or K-POW or, or, or whatever, and gone to them and say, hey, listen, I just really appreciate that when I come to church and I'm sitting in service or I'm in Wednesday night Bible study or whatever, you're taking care of my kids and not just like watching them like a babysitter. I mean, you're trying to put spiritual stuff in their life and help them to get to know God. And I just really appreciate all the time you put into preparing for that. And then you take them off my hands for an hour and a half. Thank you, Jesus. You know, That's true for all of our different areas of ministry, the nursery, the Sunday school, the children, the youth, the women, the men, the people who keep up with our grounds and our facilities, our worship team, the people who run the sound and the video, the people who prepare food, the people who serve food, the people who work so hard to set up for dinners and banquets, and the people who tear down and clean up, and it includes almost every single person in this room. And again, it'd be so easy to say, well, I work just as hard as they do, and I don't get much thanks. That may be true, but the thing is, you'd sure like to get some, wouldn't you? It sure would encourage you, wouldn't you? 
It sure would make you feel more part of a close body of believers and a family that really care about each other. I think of what Jesus said in Matthew 7, 12. So whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them. Now, again, this is not some kind of, I'm not coming down on you because I don't see this happen. I see this happening all the time. I'm just saying that if we really want to deal with this pride issue on the inside, this is one of the best ways. Get your eyes off of yourself and, and, and just thank and appreciate everybody you can. Thank and appreciate everybody. Now, helpful hint. This idea will work wonders in your marriage, too. If you're married. This would be the number one principle in having a happy, wonderful marriage is take your eyes off of yourself and put them on the other person and always live for, work for the other one and meeting their needs and letting them know that they're appreciated. And you get two people doing that, boy, you can't be in a better relationship. But it also works with parents and kids too. There are some kids and teenagers that need to know how much their parents love them and appreciate them. But young people, I want to tell you, there's some parents that really need to know that too. Especially in the teen years when sometimes things get a little rocky. Again, everything I just said about the body of Christ, it, it, it works wonders for family, marriage, friendships, any relationship. But this showing appreciation helps us with pride because it gets our mind off of ourselves and it helps us realize how much others really do for the kingdom of God. The third and last one is this, serve God by serving others. You really want to you know, deal with this pride issue, be a servant. Don't be focused so much on being served, but on serving. Serve God by serving others. Peter, when he talks about spiritual gifts, he doesn't go into a long list, but he gives a little summary thing in 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 10 to 11. He says, as each has received a gift, use it to serve one another. As good stewards of God's varied grace. He says, you have received God's grace not only for yourself, but God wants to extend his grace through you to other people. So you do that by serving them. And as you serve others in the areas and ways that God has called you to serve, his grace flows through you to them. So you're serving God, but you're also serving others. And your focus isn't yourself. It's God and his impact on other people. He goes on to say, whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God, whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him be glory and dominion and forever and ever. Amen. Let me ask you a couple more questions here. Who do you serve? Who do you serve? How do you serve? Where do you serve? Now, there's a lot of different realms in which that can be true. A lot of them outside the, 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 the context of our church. I hope you serve people in your world, in your family, in your workplace, and not just because that's what you're supposed to do or whatever, but in Jesus' name, that you're, you're, you're actively seeking to do what God wants you to do in each of your relationships and your, your, your uh, uh, contexts at home and at work and at school and wherever you might be. But within the body of Christ, and again, that can to some degree take place outside these four walls because the body of Christ is all around the world and we can do a lot of things for the kingdom of God that doesn't have anything to do with this particular church. But this is our church. This is our body. This is our family. If this is your church, who do you serve? Where do you serve? Do you serve? Let me ask you another question that none of us wants to have to answer. What is it that you're too good to do? I hope your answer was nothing. I'll do whatever God tells But it's just like the pride thing. There may be things that popped into your head. And there are certain things we can't do. It just, it's just not possible. I had to go have some blood drawn the other day for some lab tests. And I always tell them, I said, you know, it never really bothers me to have my blood drawn, but I can't watch. And I could never do it. It's not because I wouldn't be willing. I'd be laying flat out on the floor. So there are certain things we can't do, but what are some things that you could do, but you're too good to do? That'll help us to kind of get us in the mindset of what's really going on in our hearts and our lives and our attitudes in the body of Christ. We look back at the life of Jesus and you read the Gospels 
and it seems like almost every time you turn around in the story of Jesus, the disciples are arguing over one particular thing. Who is the most important? And can I give you a hint? It's not people saying, oh, Peter, you're the most important. No, 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 John, you're the most important. No, they're all arguing because they think they should be the most important. And that's why we have such wonderful teaching in the Gospels from Jesus' own lips about how that's not how we do it in God's economy. We serve others. One of the primary places is in Matthew 20, verses 20 to 5 to 28. Um, actually, James and John had come with their mother to Jesus, and they're related to Jesus. And I think I preached on this on Mother's Day. And uh, said, Jesus, would you do us a favor? He says, what do you want? He said, let James and John be the one on your right and left hand when you come to your kingdom. The places of most authority and position and power. <laughs> and Jesus says, that's not my decision to make, it's God's. And he gives them a couple questions to answer, and they talk about it. But... All the other disciples get upset because that's what they wanted. And so what Jesus says after that in Matthew 20, 25 to 28, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles, there's people that don't even know God, they lord it over them and their great ones exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be your slave, even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. She said, in the kingdom of God, glory comes, position comes, the favor of God comes by being a servant. Leaders serve. And he himself was the greatest example. You can read it later, but the story in John 13, 1 to 15 where they go into the upper room and Jesus washes his disciples' feet. When I asked that question earlier, what is it that you're too good to do? Foot washing would have been one of the answers that would come to the disciples' minds because that is something that you couldn't even force a slave to do. It was considered so disgusting and demeaning and beneath anybody's dignity. And because of that, nobody bothered washing anybody else's feet or even their own feet. When they went to the upper room and so jesus washed his disciples feet and he says just as i have done for you you should do for each other maybe not literally wash each other's feet but you should serve one another i want to challenge you to regularly do something for god and others that requires more humility or is less important than what you believe god has called and gifted you to do that was a little convoluted so let me spell it out here if you know what God has called you and gifted you to do, a certain position, a certain responsibility, a certain ministry, I want to challenge you on a regular basis to do something totally unrelated to that that you, in your flesh anyway, might would consider as much lower than that. Go clean a toilet. Go whatever that might be. I've got a philosophy that I try to live by. I don't want to ask anybody to do anything that I wouldn't be willing to do. And not just that I wouldn't be willing to do it, but I pitch in and give a hand when I can. I'm just saying these are ways that we can deal with this pride thing. Serve God by serving others. I just want to tell you, I am so proud of our leaders in this church and most all of the people that I know that are involved in our church because I think I could walk up to just about anybody in this church, this is your church family, and say, hey, listen, I need something done that is not easy, it's not nice, whatever, and most everybody would say, what do you want done, Pastor, and I'll make sure it gets done. And that's happened many, many, many times. I can tell you that those that on the outside look to be more important areas, again, we've learned today, they're not necessarily more important, they're just that type of elders and deacons. And de I know I can go to any one of my elders or my deacons or deaconesses and ask them, would you please take care of that overflowing toilet in the bathroom because service is getting ready to start, and every single one of them say, well, where's the mop? Well, some of them wouldn't say that because they already know where it is. And, I, and I'm not trying to just point out my elders and deacons and deaconesses, but I'm saying that I believe that is true, and I've seen that in so many of you. Let me give one last warning before we wrap this all up. Make sure you're serving God and others and not just yourself. Say, what do you mean by that, Pastor? You know, you can do everything I just talked about, but you're, you're still not serving God and others. You're serving yourself. Can I tell you that I've known of pastors who were doing a phenomenal job as a pastor, 
they were a great preacher or a great teacher or great whatever but they weren't doing it so much to serve God and others but themselves in the sense that they liked the paycheck they liked the position they liked the glory they liked the adulation they liked all the things that came from being the pastor of a church they weren't really serving God or others at least not primarily they were serving themselves I think of our worship team. I love our worship team. I'm so proud of our young people getting so involved in worship. I know one of the things that Pastor Jan challenges them with, and I do from time to time, is make sure that what you're doing, you give it your best. And you pray for God's anointing to rest upon you. He's given you those gifts, but pray for his anointing. But you make sure you do it for the glory of Jesus. Not to say, hey, I play in a band on a stage every weekend. Hey, I'm up there, everybody can see me, and I can sing, and I can play. Because then you're not serving God and others, you're serving yourself. And everything I just said, it applies to every single area of ministry. It gets down to attitude, it gets down to heart, it gets down to those things that we have to examine. Getting back to point one, to think of yourself seriously, and what, what really is my motivation? So as we wrap this up, not just the sermon for today, but this whole sermon series, we've been talking about building the body. Thank God for our unity. May God help us to continue to walk in that unity. May God help us to strengthen our connections and our relationships with one another so that we can be even more effective at loving each other and encouraging one another and supporting one another just as the foundation to reach a lost and dying world. Thank God for our diversity that he's given us so many different people that can do so many different things and when somebody's missing, you notice it. I mean, this morning we noticed that our key sound guy was gone and the guy he arranged to be there couldn't be here at the last minute and thank God for, for people that could step into the gap but it's like, Ooh, what are we going to do? Thank God for our diversity that God provides and, and pray. We've got areas of ministry where we need more people to be involved. Pray that God will raise those people up. Thank God that as far as the inferiority thing is that there, is, there are none in the kingdom of God that are inferior to others. The God looks at every position and place and person. If you're serving where God puts you, you are significant. So may God help us to be content and serve faithfully where he's placed us. And then from today, may God help us to serve in humility. I want to tell you something. Everyone that's part of this church family is needed and has a significant part to play. I want to challenge you and encourage you, if you've not yet done so, find your place for all of us that we serve in humility. So as we leave this place today, I want to challenge you to really apply this message. Do a really sober examination of your life. Say, God, I really want to serve you in the right way and with the right attitude. Would you show me anywhere where my attitude needs to be adjusted and help me to do it so you don't have to do it for me? I want to challenge you to show appreciation and make it a habit. Let's take Paul seriously when he says, outdo one another in showing honor. And then let's serve God by serving others. Find your place of service and do it humbly. Let's all stand together. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we have the privilege of being part of your family. First of all, because it means that our sins are forgiven and we can have relationship with you. And God, we thank you that we're part of a family here on this earth, Lord God, that we have to, don't have to go it alone, that we don't have to somehow struggle through this at times difficult life all by ourselves. But Lord, you put us with others that we can relate to and with and love on and help and encourage and be encouraged by. And yes, yeah, sometimes we rub each other the wrong way. And yes, yeah, sometimes there's difficulties and, and dif differences that cause discussions, but that because of you, we can get those things worked out. Lord, I thank you that you've given us the privilege of doing things for you. Lord, of making a difference in our world for your kingdom. And God, I pray that you would help us to do that even more and more effectively. Lord, I believe as we apply the messages, Lord God, of, of, of these last couple of weeks of being a tight, close, strong, healthy body with good relationships working together that we can accomplish so much more than we ever have. And Lord, of course... 
We can't do it without you. We need you, Lord. Fill us. Fill us afresh and anew with your Holy Spirit, Lord God. You've given us gifts. We thank you for those gifts. Help us to use them responsibly. But Lord, we pray for an anointing that comes upon us that goes away above and beyond that. The power of your Spirit at work in what we do that goes beyond what we could do by ourselves. I pray that the result is that people would come to know you. We'd all grow closer to you. We'd all see your kingdom established, Lord God. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven as Jesus taught us to pray. Thank you, Lord. God, I thank you for the people of this church. I thank you for our leaders. I thank you, for, thank you, Lord, for each one who serves in ministry, who have made that commitment. They're going to be a part of ministry. They've found their place. They're serving faithfully. Thank you for them, Lord God. Raise up more. God, purify our hearts. Lord, there's a lot of different ways this applies today. Help us to know how we need to apply it, Lord. Father, we thank you and we praise you for it. In Jesus' name, amen.